So I picked this uh, urinary tract infections because I knew Lloyd was going to be here. So, and it's near and dear to his heart. So, um, pardon the corny title and thanks for asking me back. And how long would you like me to take? I had sort of figured 20 minutes, but you're a little behind. So, okay. So this is a common problem, and what I was hoping to accomplish in about 15 minutes is really just to review indications for ordering urine cultures understand the difference between UTIs and bacteriuria because I do think there is a lot of confusion about that and certainly from a stewardship perspective we see a lot of antibiotics being used for bacteria in the urine and then really recognizing when you should be treating positive urine cultures. So I just made up this case, it's a generic case, it could be a 75 year old woman admitted to anywhere um, except that she's admitted to CCU, she's required intubation, and uh, now has a central line and a Foley catheter that have been inserted, as uh, is probably routine for critical care areas. She's hemodynamically stable. Her temperature is 38.1, and because she has a low-grade temperature, blood and urine has been sent for culture. So your culture result comes back the following day, and uh, this is what it says. It says, it's from an indwelling catheter, and they're greater than 100 times 10 to the 6 colonies of Klebsiella pneumonia. Okay, so that's a fairly common urinary pathogen. Uh, the susceptibilities are there, but the question really is, does this patient have a urinary tract infections, and what antibiotics should you prescribe, and for how long? Does anybody care to answer the questions? Pardon me? Get an RNM. Get an RNM. Okay, so Lloyd says, not sure, need more information. So this is a really common scenario. This happens all the time. The result is reflective of bacteriuria. So bacteriuria refers to bacteria in the urine. It doesn't say whether or not you have an infection or not. It just means that there are bacteria in the urine. However, unless the patient is symptomatic, it's really rarely important. There are exceptions. Uh, clearly, if you're febrile neutropenic, it doesn't matter um, what's going on, you'll be treated because we found organisms that might be responsible for your fever. Um, certain other populations like renal transplants, they may have a lower threshold for treating. But in general, if there are no symptoms, it's really of no consequence. Um, urine analysis or urine RNM may be helpful, but they're not perfect tests. Um, however, the utility really is in knowing that your uh, urine microscopy is negative. If it's completely negative, you have pretty well ruled out a urinary tract infection. There are caveats, of course. So I think we're all used to dipsticks. You can either have a bedside uh, dipstick done here and or you can send your urine specimen off to the lab to have a proper microscopy done. Microscopy will look at white cells, red cells, casts, and they will often report bacteria. Dipsticks give you uh, results that uh, show leukocyte esterase as well as nitrates, which are the two things that we really tend to focus on for urinary tract infections. So leukocyte esterase is found in white blood cells. Um, it is a proxy marker for white blood cells in your urine. The detection, so positive leukocyte esterase will correlate with at least eight to 10 white cells per high power field. Okay, so, um, we also know, though, and I'll go into this in a couple of slides, that 8 to 10 white cells per high power field may actually be normal in a significant proportion of elderly patients. Okay. The sensitivity, um, and the, the gold standard here is actually with bacteriuria, so greater than uh, 100 times 10 to the 6 colony forming units uh, per mil of um, urine. The sensitivity of leukocyte esterase is 56 to 87%, and that variability depends really on the population that you're using it in. Uh, so in hospitalized patients, it tends to be lower. In outpatient ambulatory settings, it tends to be higher. The specificity is 36 to 81%. The two numbers below, 62 and 84%, uh, are reflective of inpatient populations. Okay. So it's not really a great test. We look at it all the time, but it's not particularly um, helpful. The positive predictive value is only about 40%. The negative predictive value, however, is much higher at 93%. So if you have no leukocyte esterase, that suggests that there are no white cells and likely no bacteria in the urine. Nitrites are produced by certain organisms. They are um, byproducts of metabolism of nitrate to nitrites and um, some pathogens don't produce nitrites. So you can have 
infections by common things, E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, in which you will find nitrites in the urine, but other pathogens like um, Enterococcus, some coagulase negative Staphylococcus, generally not in urine patient populations, um, Pseudomonas will not produce nitrites, okay? Again, using the same um, parameters as I just mentioned previously, the sensitivity and specificity are not great, but again, you'll notice 58% uh, sensitivity and 85% specificity. These again are in inpatient populations and the specificity again is much higher than the sensitivity. So really these are great tests if they're negative. If they're positive, they don't really help you very much, okay? There are sometimes some false negatives and those are largely because of pathogens that don't produce nitrites if there truly is bacteriuria. For an RNM, which is uh, a specimen sent off to the lab, looked at under a microscope under high power field by a technologist, visualization of bacteria is common. So seeing a report that says bacteria many does not uh, indicate a urinary tract infection. White blood cells can be counted per high power field and um, greater than 10 white cells per high power field is the sort of accepted threshold above which we would consider uh, the count to be abnormal. Again, for bacteriuria, the sensitivity and specificity is really only 78 and 63%, okay? And the positive and negative predictive values are there. So all of this means that none of these tests is really very helpful unless they are all completely negative, okay? Bacteriuria has a strict definition. We don't usually think about it um, in this way. Generally speaking, it, it means bacteria in the urine, but there is a, a definition that is used, which is um, 10 to the 5 colony forming units uh, per liter of the, of the same organism in one specimen for men and two specimens for women. We generally don't repeat urine specimens in, in, uh, in patients. I think the important thing is that 20 or 30 or sometimes higher depending on the population percent of older women and 15 to 20 percent of older men will have asymptomatic bacteriuria. And there is really no evidence in most studies that asymptomatic bacteriuria um, has any long-term consequences if untreated, and that treatment of asymptomatic bacteria improves your morbidity or mortality. Okay. There are two um, possible deleterious co uh, consequences. One would be that actually um, we're increasing resistance by unnecessary use of antibiotics. And the second, uh, which is more recent, um, is that we may actually paradoxically increase the uh, risk of subsequent urinary tract infection. So in this, in this patient, you would really want uh, to know more information. The fever you could probably explain by her critical uh, illness, but I think urinary tract infection in the majority of um, critical care patients and those with Foley catheters really needs to be a diagnosis of exclusion. So confusion, cloudy, beha uh, cloudy behavior. Confusion, behavior change, so that could be aggression, somnolence. Cloudy or malodorous urine are not uh, symptoms of urinary tract infections, and urine cultures generally should not be collected for these reasons. Okay. Uh, we see on, on the units, and I'm sure you see all the time, that uh, nurses will send specimens because the urine looks cloudy or it smells um, quite strong. Okay. So symptoms suggestive of a UTI, fever, rigors, a history, which clearly you're not going to be able to get from this patient, suprapubic tenderness or discomfort, and CVA tenderness or discomfort, okay? So if you asked for an RNM in this lady, I think one of the things to recognize is that it is extremely common to have some degree of white cells in your urine when you have a Foley catheter in particular. So we would say probably above 30 is abnormal. If you don't have another explanation for her fever that makes sense, then perhaps she does have a urinary tract infection. Uh, but if her urine RNM is completely normal or there are only zero to five white cells, um, then she likely does not have a urinary tract infection. So for bacteria, extremely co common in your population and in our inpatient population, I think we need to do a better job of educating when to culture and when not to. Um, it, it's not an expensive test for the lab, but cumulatively, it becomes an expensive test. And uh, we should not be treating urine cultures without evidence of infection, which really means symptoms primarily. Okay. In outpatient settings, if you had somebody who presented with symptoms, uh, the guidelines really recommend just treating empirically. You don't even bother culturing, unless there's some, um, some more specific reason why you may need to know culture, drug allergies, or 
um, history of resistant organisms, perhaps, but otherwise um, we shouldn't be doing them as much as we are. Questions? So I knew you were going to ask this question, and I have slides to address that. Okay. So I think that's one of the key things. Okay. Yeah, every, every surgical, not every surgical patient, but many of our surgical patients, because that is tradition, will get a urine culture and an R&M, and we don't know what to do with it. So symptomatic bacteriuria is a urinary tract infection. Okay, the, the standard thresholds for significant colony counts in your urine that are uh, more highly correlated with a UTI are listed there, 100 times 10 to the 6. Okay. Um, but you can have fewer colony forming units present. There's always a number on a urine culture, um, but if you're symptomatic, that may still be a urinary tract infection. So this is, this is the number that correlates most strongly with actually having a urinary tract infection, but certainly you can have symptoms in a UTI if you have fewer than 100 times 10 to the 6. Okay. If you have symptoms, as I said previously, a UTI is likely present. I think the one exception would be uh, immediately after you've had a Foley catheter removed, there will be some dysuria. So um, I would watch that for you know, 24, 48 hours before I just jumped on antibiotics for that patient. We do have guidelines at TOH, and I'm not going to go through these, I think, for time um, in detail, but there are definitely oral options for uncomplicated um, cystitis and lower urinary tract infections. And I don't know how many of you uh, know on OASIS that we do have guidelines for these things. So if, if systemic symptoms are present, fever, rigors, or if you think there's pyelonephritis, which may be indicated by either imaging or um, abdominal or flank pain, you may need to start intravenous antibiotics. You may also need a longer course of therapy depending on whether you're treating a man or a woman and what antibiotic you're using. So there is a range. Um, I would suggest that you go on to OASIS and look at the pathways that we have because those will fit 90% of patients who we're treating. Okay. So please refer to our nice guidelines on OASIS. I, ha I also have a slide shot of it here, so I'll show you that. Okay. So uh, symptoms have to be present before you start treatment. For the majority of patients, even those with Foley catheter-associated UTIs, oral antibiotics will be adequate. And then if you have systemic symptoms uh, or you're concerned about pyelonephritis, it may be appropriate to start initially with IV therapy, and they may need a longer course of treatment. So this is the OASIS page, but under resources here, do you guys ever use this resources section? No? Lloyd, Lloyd does because he knows where the information is. <laughs> yeah, so if you just go, go on to OASIS and you click on resources, you get this drop-down menu. There is a whole infectious disease resources section, okay, which has uh, an antibiogram, empiric therapy guidelines for patients being admitted. There's a C. diff treatment algorithm, but if you go to the bottom, we have four UTI pathways. Okay, so one is asymptomatic bacteria. We discussed at length whether we actually needed a pathway, but it bottom line says if there are no symptoms, don't treat. Um, catheter associated, urinary tract infection with systemic symptoms and without systemic symptoms. Okay, so. I did not put a printout of these. They're all two pages, but they actually walk you through what symptoms are present. If this, then UTI possible, treat with this. If no, then no urinary tract infection. Okay. So it is quite um, helpful. Okay. And this is Lloyd's question, and this is uh, what I'm going to end with. But my, my patient is scheduled for a valve replacement bypass. Okay. So I'm hearing that routine... Uh, routinely, we order urine analysis and urine cultures prior to surgery, and particularly for patients who are going for valve replacements or valve repairs. So if a patient has bacteria, does he or she need to be treated prior to surgery? Okay. So there's not a whole lot of evidence in the literature. There's one study, this was done um, in Iran, published in 2013, and it was a retrospective uh, study but bacteria, they, they looked at urine analysis, and their conclusion was that bacteria that are present on microscopy are not associated with the occurrence of surgical site infections. In 151 patients undergoing cardiac surgeries, the exact procedures were not specified, so they may have been bypassed, may have been valved. Um, they didn't actually comment on the, uh, the incidence of infection. All they said was that there's no correlation with seeing bacteria and having a post-op surgical site infection. 
So that was it. That's all I found for cardiac surgery and bacteria. <laughs> okay. So, however, there are many studies that have been published in orthopedics looking at the same question prior to joint replacements. Okay. So I don't know if we can extrapolate. Clearly, the population is very difficult, but there are at least, um, there are at least half a dozen studies. So looking at a routine urine analysis, Bouvet and et al., looking at 510 patients who were pre-op for um, joint replacements, identified that 35% of them had pyuria, so white cells in the urine with no symptoms, okay? And um, it's the same study uh, listed on the, on the next line. So 36% were actually bacteriuric, bacteriuric pre-op, okay? Postoperatively, there was a 5% incidence of urinary tract infection, okay? but the organisms that they, uh, th the individuals who had positive cultures or UTIs post-op were not those who had bacteria seen on microscopy pre-op necessarily. There was no clear correlation, okay? Also, when they cultured the urine, 36% um, had pre-op bacteria, um, and of those who developed surgical site, in, uh, sorry, of those who developed urinary tract infections, the majority were unrelated to um, what they grew pre-op, if they grew anything, or the development of a prosthetic joint infection or surgical site infection. Okay, so it's kind of confusing, but there's a large proportion of patients who will have white cells or bacteria in their urine pre-op, and if they get a surgical site infection, there's no correlation with what they had pre-op and what grows in their surgical site. Okay. There are a couple of other studies um, from Europe. One, the second one, Martinez Velez, uh, looked at 215 patients, again, uh, prior to joint replacements. They only had a 5% um, incidence of asymptomatic bacteria, which is what ASB is there, which is quite low. And treatment of asymptomatic bacteria pre-op didn't have any impact on whether or not patients developed prosthetic joint infections or surgical site infections post-op. Okay. The last study, again, similar findings, slightly larger. 29% um, had asymptomatic bacteria. So this study, I would, the second study I would actually question because they have such a low uh, incidence of asymptomatic bacteria. I think the 29 and 36% is much more realistic. In this whole um, group of 471, they only had one prosthetic joint infection, which uh, is great. Um, and that individual, again, the, the occurrence of prosthetic joint infection was not influenced by whether or not they had bacteria in their urine pre-op. The best study for this is the largest. It was um, published in 2014, almost 2,500 patients. And they had 12.1%, this is a Portuguese and European um, UK study. They had 12.1% of their patients pre-op who had asymptomatic bacteria. They had 1.7% or 43 patients who developed a surgical site or prosthetic joint infection post-op. They did state that the overall surgical site infection rate was higher in the group that had asymptomatic bacteria than the group that did not. But treatment of asymptomatic bacteria, because they randomized their bacteriorics to half treatment, half no treatment, had, had no impact on the development of a surgical site infection. Okay. And furthermore, again, the pathogens from the surgical site infection were totally not correlated with what grew in their urine. Okay. So all of this is leading me to say that there really is no point, at least if you're having joint replacement, um, in having a urine culture and urine microscopy as a routine pre-op test. Okay. So my key point for you is I have no idea because we don't have the evidence in the cardiac surgery population, but I think we may be able to extrapolate from this. I'm sure somebody's going to do this study. Um, I know we always used to recommend treating asymptomatic bacteria prior to valves in particular. Uh, more recently, I've said don't if they don't have symptoms based on the orthopedic literature. Okay. So the last section is on catheter-associated UTIs. I'm going to leave this with you to look at just in the interest of time. Um, but again, I would refer you back to the uh, guidelines that we have on OASIS.